Good evening and welcome to KTN Newsnight. I'm Joroge Mwaura. Orange Democratic Movement members of parliament want colleagues who oppose the new constitution kicked out of government and the party's leadership. The party's parliamentary group today resolved to discipline MPs who refused to toe the party line during the just concluded referendum on the new constitution. The party says rebel MPs will not be allowed to represent ODM in government or in parliamentary committees. ODM leaders who voted no have argued that they deserved slots on a House Select Committee that will oversee the implementation of the new laws. The resolution to take action on ODM MPs seen as rebels was reached during the party's parliamentary group meeting at the party's headquarters. The meeting called to take stock of the just concluded referendum on the new constitution decried a decision by a group of MPs to campaign against the new laws. PG has therefore decided today that the process of taking disciplinary action in accordance with the constitution will be initiated. The meeting resolved that the breakaway MPs will face disciplinary action that may include stripping them of any party positions, kicking them out of parliamentary committees, and recommending removal from government positions they hold, courtesy of party nomination. Top on the list of those facing action is Eldoret North MP William Ruto, who serves as Higher Education Minister and is also one of the party's two deputy party leaders. Keio South MP Jackson Kiptanui could also face the axe as an Assistant Minister for Environment. The fate of William Cheptumo is also hanging in the balance. The Baringo North MP is Assistant Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs and was on the North team. Aina Mois Benjamin Langatu is the party's Assistant Organizing Secretary. He's also in the line of fire, having defied the party to campaign for the rejection of the new constitution. Under the National Accord and Reconciliation Act, ODM leader Raila Odinga has the power to fire leaders that his party seconded to the cabinet in consultation with the president. It is, however, unclear if the party's position will persuade him to take that action, having given indication he would let bygones be bygones. The PG says it's time to crack the whip on rebel members of parliament serving in government on the party ticket. If you spare the road, you will spoil the child. The party says the MPs who defied the party will not serve in the crucial parliamentary select committee to oversee the implementation of the new constitution. It would be highly unlikely that a person, say, facing disciplinary action can at the same time enjoy the same status that they have enjoyed before in being appointed to such a committee. In an interview with KTN soon after conceding defeat in the referendum, Higher Education Minister William Ruta was categorical that his position in the cabinet had nothing to do with his position on the new constitution. Are you crossing your fingers that your job as a minister could be on the line? First and foremost, this is not a government project. I refuse. The Constitution of Kenya is a people's document. It is not a government document. MPs who broke ranks with the party over the Constitution have described the threat of disciplinary action as an act of intolerance on diverging opinion and have dared the party to go ahead with the action. Does it mean that uh, they are also going to discipline the three million Kenyans who oppose the, the constitution because most of those ones are also ODM members in the grassroots. According to the ODM constitution, disciplinary action to be taken against Aaron members include expulsion from the party. But it is not clear at this point if that is the position the party will be taking in disciplining some of its Aaron members that include Higher Education Minister William Ruto, who led opposition to the proposed constitution. Emmanuel Talam, Katian at the ODM headquarters. The Committee of Experts wants Kenyans to forget about making changes to the new constitution for at least 10 years. This would avoid a repeat of the mutilation of the old constitution, which was amended about 10 times in its first six years. COE Chairman Nzamba Kitonga said Kenyans should be patient and let the new laws serve them before recommending any changes. He argued any amendment now will lead to the distortion of the document. According to the COE, there are no contentious issues in the new constitution since all were adequately addressed at various stages and ratified by all Kenyans through a referendum. Has proposed a wait of 10 years for any reasonable amendments to the ratified constitution, saying Kenyans needed time to test it before considering changes. 
Committee Chairman Zamba Kitonga termed as premature calls by members of the clergy and politicians to have the new constitution amended now. Amending even one clause of a, con a constitution impacts on the entire document, leading to distortion and disharmony in its structure. Indeed, this is how the old constitution became disfigured beyond recognition. As Kenyans embark on implementation, Kitonga called for vigilance lest the reform agenda be derailed. Those who have enjoyed the status quo and the privilege under the old order will always seek to subvert and derail the long walk to reform, even as we fervently seek to convert, to convert them to the fold. On their part, the National Council of Churches has argued many Kenyans voted yes because President Mwai Kibaki and Prime Minister Raila Odinga promised changes soon after. They have threatened to initiate amendments using the avenues provided in the new laws, including raising a million signatures. He said the Constitutional Amendment Act only recognized issues that were raised during the constitution-making period and wondered why the church and a section of politicians have insisted on using the words contentious issues. Most of the clergy in the rural areas did not bother to read the new constitution. They instead read various pastoral letters to their unsuspecting congregations who took them as gospel truth. The experts are recommending that the contents and implications of the new constitution be taught in schools and colleges to enable all Kenyans fully understand it. President Mwai Kibaki is due to proclaim the new constitution on August 27th at a ceremony to be held at Uhuru Park. Denis Sokari, KTN Newsnight. Even as the committee of experts appear to wish away talk of immediate amendments, former President Moy cautioned that concerns by himself and other Kenyans who voted against the new constitution should not be neglected or wished away. Moy said contentious clauses which tolerate abortion, the land chapter and the haphazard creation of counties are likely to remain a source of friction well into the future if not addressed. He explained that his decision to reject the constitution was informed by the realization that its passage went against the basic tenets of morality, harmony, social cohesion, national unity, and social economic development. Mze Moy said, as a Kenyan who served in a position of leadership, he feels a new constitution should not be a contestable or divisive document, but one that earns the unanimity and respect of a cross-section of as many citizens as possible. Now to those who endorsed the new constitution, Moy said he understands their belief that it will solve their problems and did not therefore wish to begrudge their trust or dampen their expectations of the prospect of a better future. Now, Parliament's Departmental Committee on Defence and Foreign Relations today raised fresh questions about Kenya's property transactions abroad. MPs queried the sale of diplomatic properties in Lagos and the purchase of missions in Islamabad and Brussels in the past five years. The committee has been embroiled in a war of words with Foreign Affairs Minister Moses Wetangula over the controversial purchase of property in Tokyo for just over one and a half billion shillings. Wetangula maintains that he made the best decisions under the circumstances and has welcomed an audit of the accounts. During the session, Foreign Affairs Minister Moses Wetangula was hard-pressed to explain the chain of events that had seen the acquisition of diplomatic properties abroad in circumstances deemed dubious. It emerged that plans to develop a free plot offered by the Nigerian government were halted and money from the sale of a defunct mission in Lagos wired to purchase the Tokyo property. New reports indicate that construction of Kenya's mission in Islamabad has been delayed by rising terrorism in Pakistan and property in Brussels is believed to be protected as a national monument and cannot be developed or altered. But Wetangula and his permanent secretary Mwangi Thwe defended the transactions. What is our principal occupation in Brussels? Our engagement with the EU. So when you are looking for a chancery, you look for how proximate it is to the EU. 
Because even in the pursuit of our economic diplomacy, our number one source of grant funds is the EU. We want to quickly and easily access the EU. There are also said to have been fluctuations in construction costs in Islamabad with several questions raised about the procedure followed to acquire the property. This following revelations that the ministry may have violated the Public Procurement and Disposals Act. That the, this thing was so urgent that you needed to be exempted. That did not persuade the Director General of Public Procurement Oversight Authority, but you went ahead and used the same. What is the justification? I think it will the two defended their actions, saying despite pressure by the Nigerians to develop the free plot in Abuja, they chose to buy the Tokyo property because it was becoming very expensive to maintain rented property in Tokyo. The mission being constructed in Pakistan is running almost a year behind schedule and is set to cost Kenyan taxpayers over 400 million shillings, 50 million shillings more than was budgeted for by the time it is completed. Wilkinson Albuquetian, Newsnight. For the first time since the highly praised referendum, Ahmed Isa Hassan, the chairman of the Interim Independent Electoral Commission, spoke to KTN about how his team did it and what their most trying moments were. Here is the story of the massive exercise through the eyes of the man at the helm of the electoral body. After 15 months at the helm of the IIEC and with a workforce of almost 400,000 people, most of them casuals, Ahmed Isaac Hassan, a Nairobi city lawyer, carried out Kenya's second referendum with surprising success. I think I want to give credit to, you see, you may, you may buy equipment or machines, but they don't uh, deliver. It is the people who deliver it. And therefore, as a commission, we laid a lot of emphasis on the integrity of the people that we employ and how we employ them. In a country recovering from a violently disputed election, few knew what to expect. The IIEC had both their credibility and the nation's future hanging in the balance. The integrity of the process that we employed to manage the elections, starting from the introduction of the electronic uh, voter registration, which was our way of uh, trying to bring in uh, a new technology to uh, create a, a credible, a, a clean register, which I hope we can be able to extend uh, in the coming years before the general elections. And of course, the other issue was uh, the transmission of results electronically. Uh, was also a big milestone for the Commission. Skepticism ran deep even after a peaceful, efficient vote plunging the commissioners into anxious moments at the National Tiling Center at the Bomas of Kenya. When the first 400 results came in, there was that uh, the no were leading and the yes were down. But then when you announce now the final, the 9,000, which it came, there was a big jump. And uh, after we announced that, made that announcement and we went out, of course there was a big uh, complaint by, by those who were not happy with that results and they wanted to interrogate the system and they, they raised a lot of concerns. We gave them all the cooperation. We availed to them everything. So that was a very trying moment. The man on whom the Herculean task of running the referendum was placed, however, says the credit goes not just to the IIEC, but to the Kenyan people as well. There was a sense of a, a national collective will to do better this time than 2008. I think everybody, at all levels, there was that, there was that will in, in our hearts and minds that we wanted to do better. Despite the challenges, Hassan says he wouldn't mind doing the job again and again. Uh, like uh, any other Kenyan, I'm very proud to serve in any position uh, given to me by, 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 by the country. And yes, I will be willing to serve again and uh, conduct the general election with this team, because I think this team the IIEC's constitutional mandate runs until May of 2011, with at least four by-elections still left in its to-do list. Now, Tino Kiti, Newsnight.